I mean, just as a brief way of introduction, we were very lucky to have uh, Joe uh, present to us about four years ago now. Yeah, uh, in yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. respiratory meeting, talking about the the caliper tool that uh, he developed for lung segmentation for fibrosis, and having seen the the literature since then i believe joe is only uh just has only gone from strength to strength so i'm very much looking forward to hearing uh how that has uh, developed especially in light of the the phenomenal way that uh, you managed to seize control of the very chaotic situation that came about with covid and turn that to your to your advantage so without further ado i'll uh, hand over to yourself and look forward to hearing uh hearing your talk Okay, well, uh, I'll share my screen. First of all, thank you very much to Fiona uh, for inviting me and thank you very much to everyone in Cambridge for attending this talk. Uh, let me now share. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah, I, I can actually see my screen on one yes, of the little uh, screens, so I think that's fine. Yeah, so, we can hear you and see your screen. Perfect, perfect. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about my career as, as it is. Uh, sometimes that's actually the most interesting part of the talk beyond the science. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about computer analysis of fibrosing lung disease, hopefully adding to bits that I talked about four years ago. So just as a background for the trainees out there, uh, I can tell you that when I went to medical school, I really wasn't very motivated to study. I had a lot of difficulties in my first year and second year. The second year, I had to reset my exams over the summer. And, you know, one of the hardest things I found was learning how to learn. So, you know, we all have a particular way we learn information and you've got to discover what that way is for yourself. And that took me a long time, but I was very lucky in my fourth year at medical school, I decided to do a BSc, uh, primarily to delay being a doctor for as long as possible because I didn't feel I was ready. But that was my first taste of research. And I worked at what was then the Imperial Cancer Research Fund, which now has become amalgamated into CRUK. So, uh, and I did a project on stem cells. And this was at a time when stem cells were very kind of topical and exciting. And I worked with an incredible team uh, who really made me feel part of the team, really took me on, not as the medical student who was just there pipetting stuff, which is actually all I was and all I was doing. But they really made, you know, wanted my opinion on things and valued me and made me want to pursue science, I think, in the future. Now, I was very lucky that that paper was published in Nature. It was nothing to do with me. I was just the guy with pipette, you know, the kind of image you get when science is talked about on TV. Uh, but, you know, there was one weekend where I went in where I knew something happened on a slide that no one else in the world knew. And that's like such a precious moment. And I wanted to kind of recreate that. Of course, it's all been downhill since that Nature paper, nothing comparable. But uh, I'll tell you what I did after that. So I did a bit of medicine, a bit of surgery, a bit of a &E in my training. This was at a time where you could do all those things and you often went into radiology with a higher degree, like an MRC or S or an MRCP. But I, and I, I, I applied at the time because uh, I knew I had the best components of medicine and surgery, but I applied during a time called MTAS where there was suddenly a glut of applicants uh, to different specialities and you didn't need to do higher training beyond your within your SHO years to enter radiology. And because I had so many candidates, they had very strict essential criteria to apply that year. And you had to have had a basic life support certificate that was in date. And mine was out of date. And I found out since that friends of mine just, you know, said theirs was in date and then renewed it later. But I told this truth and I said, you know, mine's out of date. And so I wasn't eligible to apply for radiology that year. And so suddenly I had a year of life to fill before I could apply to radiology again. And I thought, what do I really want to do? And I thought, you know, this is a real disappointment, but let's see if I can turn it into an opportunity. So I applied to uh, a tropical medicine diploma because I knew I wanted to work in the developing world. And there's only two in the country, London and Liverpool. And Liverpool had a course starting in four days. And that day someone had dropped out. So they had one space. And I thought, right, this is serendipity. Now I'm supposed to do this. So I went and did a tropical medicine diploma in Liverpool. And then in that diploma, you have different NGOs come and talk to you. So just to say to the trainees, you know, you think your career is going to be based on your careful preparation and planning and your aptitude for subjects and your passion. 
but really sometimes it's just chance. It's the mentors that take an interest in you. It's the needs of the workforce. And sometimes it's, you know, your life situation, your partner has to move city. So you follow them and get a job in that hospital and do that specialty. So, you know, some of our life choices or our life situations are quite random in, in origin. My research career really began after I trained in radiology at King's and I spent a year in New Zealand as well. And I did a fellowship at the Brompton. Uh, this was a project between uh, Imper well, the Brompton and the Mayo Clinic in America. And this was at the time where machine learning was kind of maturing. This was 2013 to 14. And the Mayo Clinic had developed a tool that could quantify damage on CTs and patients with lung fibrosis. And, you know, we are not very good at quantifying the amount of damage on a CT scan. We're actually not very good at quantifying change over time. And the other interesting thing is we're getting to the stage where computers can see things that we can't see. So I'll talk a bit about that uh, in the coming slides. So that work was quite challenging for several reasons. One was that the tool the Mayo Clinic had developed, you know, we ended up saying that the bit of the tool that they didn't think was so valuable was actually the most interesting bit. So, you know, there's a bit of discussion to be had there and uh, balancing out different opinions. But actually, I think my MSF years really helped with that, you know, uh, not conflict resolution, but talking and debating and managing uh, different uh, sets of people. I think was a real advantage. And that's something we don't get taught enough in medicine. So right now, after I finished my research, I took some time to write a fellowship application. I got what's called an intermediate fellowship. So this is a fellowship with a Wellcome Trust, which funded me for five years to myself and a team to do pretty much full-time research. So I do one day a week in UCLH, four days a week in the university. And this is the kind of, bits of work that my group cover. So we're interested in lung cancer, uh, lung cancer screening, uh, COVID, as Jonathan and Fiona had mentioned before, cystic fibrosis, lung fibrosis, COPD. So quite a wide ranging gamut of diffuse lung diseases and lung cancer. This is my team, uh, a mixture of postdocs and PhD students. And these are PhD students that I also co-supervise where for most, almost all of them, actually, I'm the only clinical supervisor. So I'm, I'm quite involved in their supervision as well. So it keeps me very busy. And the way I like to think of our work in imaging is that we ask slightly different questions to a clinician who is interested in research, because we have kind of more specific image based uh, questions that we try and broach. And I, dry, I divide them into diagnostic and prognostic imaging questions. And the type of disease, the organ system, the imaging modality are all kind of interchangeable to these five imaging challenges. So I could say lung cancer for all of these, or I could say lung fibrosis. It doesn't matter. I think they're quite uh, interchangeable. And so I would say there's diagnostic questions and prognostic questions. And the diagnostic questions are, can we identify lung fibrosis at an earlier stage, for example, or lung cancer at an earlier stage on imaging? And can we improve the diagnostic accuracy uh, of lung fibrosis or lung cancer? Because, you know, as radiologists, we vary in our opinions. And computers, for example, may be able to bring a second pair of eyes that will help us improve our certainty of some of the features we're seeing on a scan. And then the prognostic questions uh, I divide into three. So the baseline CT, the first CT a patient has, can we use that CT to predict how that patient's going to progress or what their outcome is going to be? And if you can do that in drug trial settings, for example, you can identify patients that would most be, be most beneficial to be included in that drug trial because they're most likely to reach a drug trial endpoint. On the longitudinal CTs that a patient has or a longitudinal MRI or ultrasound, can we identify how much worse their disease is getting? Uh, and that's really important because then that gives the patient an indication of their trajectory of disease. But also for trials, for example, you have a measure that gives you an indication of treatment response. Is this patient improving as much as you'd expect them to be? Or is their improvement better on this new drug versus existing therapies? 
The last prognostic group is probably the most challenging, but it's the one I find the most interesting. And that's trying to identify subtypes of your particular disease of interest. So in lung fibrosis, you know, are there endotypes of lung fibrosis that we can identify from imaging where patients have a differing outcome and therefore may benefit from different management strategies? Uh, yeah. I don't need to go into this into too much detail, I think, you know, uh, this is just the structural, I mean, the functional units of the lung are the secondary pulmonary lobule and damage in different areas uh, reflect different types of patterns of damage on CT scans. So, you know, this is actually kind of similar to the hepatocytes. You have these hexagonal uh, secondary pulmonary lobules with here in the lung, the airway and the pulmonary artery in the center and the veins running through the interstitium. And the interstitium is basically, for those of you that aren't chest physician, uh, radiologists, the interstitium is like a scaffold, a connective tissue scaffold that holds the lung together. So it runs around the secondary pulmonary lobules, it runs around the central pulmonary artery and airway and stops it all collapsing uh, during respiration. But actually, you know, different uh, patterns of damage in these different compartments give you different imaging features. So airspace disease gives you consolidation of ground glass. Airways disease can give you bronchial wall thickening or bronchiectasis. And interstitial disease is really, you know, fibrosis, reticulation, and then honeycomb cysts. So the talk today is going to be focused primarily on fibrosing lung disease, of which there are five main subtypes, but the most important one is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's an unusual disease. We don't really know what causes it. We know that it happens more commonly in older male smokers. Uh, but you're, you know, from the time of diagnosis to death is about three to five years, which is worse than many cancers. And sadly, there's a diagnostic delay from when a patient first has symptoms to when they get diagnosed of two years. So for two years, this patient is losing lung function and we haven't given them a diagnosis and therefore we haven't been able to institute therapies in a timely way. Uh, until recently, you know, the treatments for lung fibrosis were either transplantation uh, or palliation. And then in 2014, two new drugs became available. And I'll talk about why they've changed how we try and assess these patients uh, in a few slides time. Now, when we have a disease like IPF or lung fibrosis, there are several ways we can try and estimate disease severity. One is with symptoms, so patient reported outcomes. Another way is by looking at how far they can walk or how fast they can walk in a certain time. And then we have the gold standard, which is lung function tests. And interestingly, there are two different types of lung function tests that are important. There's something called DLCO, the, uh, the diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide. That tells you how well oxygen diffuses into the air spaces, across the interstitium, through the capillary wall, into the bloodstream. And that's really good at estimating how bad someone's disease is when they first present. But it's quite a noisy longitudinal measurement so for assessing disease progression over time, we use something called a forced vital capacity. But even that is a noisy measure, as I'll talk about shortly. CT analysis is really considered a silver standard. But I think that in the next few years, CT is going to be a combined gold standard with lung function tests, because what we're finding is now they both give you valuable prognostic information, but they're complementary. They're not telling you the same thing, or they're not telling you about the same thing in the same patient. So for those of you, and this is probably too basic, uh, oh, actually, this is what I always put up as my normal CT of the lungs, but the eagle eye of you will see that there's actually a carcinoid uh, in that left main bronchus. So actually not a normal CT, I'm a bit naughty there. But the parenchyma is essentially normal. And this is an IPF CT as we typically see it today. So there are honeycomb cysts in a basal subpleural distribution with traction bronchiectasis. These are dilated airways pulled apart by fibrosis within the interstitium. So why is computer analysis, which is what I'm really going to talk about today, so useful or relevant in a disease like IPF? Well, it comes back to those two drug trials from 2014 that I talked about. Uh, these showed that these two drugs, perfenidone and nintadenib, can slow the rate of forced vital capacity decline in these patients, which is great news. But actually, it leads to a complication. And that's the way trials are going to be designed. 
So in those two trials, you know, there's a drug against placebo because there was no known treatment and a patient's rate of uh, lung function decline was marked. But now these new drugs have a much smaller rate of FVC decline. And what that means is that any new drug has to be within this measurement improvement. So it has to be a less than 10% decline in FVC that it's causing to show that a new drug works. But FVC has a 10% measurement in accuracy. So, you know, to show that your new drug is better than an existing drug and be better than the existing measurement noise, it means you're going to have to have a very large population of patients to study in your drug trial. And that's going to be very expensive. And pharma, pharma companies may not be willing to put that much money into these new trials. So a lack of good trial endpoints is really a roadblock to drug discovery in a disease like IPF going forward. And so people then began to say, well, you know, we take CTs in these patients. Can we use a CT to understand disease progression? And actually, this has only become more relevant over time because in 2019, a second trial for Nintadnib was published, and that was the inbuild trial. And the thoughts behind this trial was that, you know, we know that patients other than those with IPF, so some of those other fibrosing lung diseases like rheumatoid arthritis related interstitial lung disease or hypersensitivity pneumonitis, some of those patients have an outcome that's very similar to a patient with IPF. So is it that actually what's most important is just identifying progressive fibrosis in patients? And if you treat those patients with progressive fibrosis, is diagnosis less important? And so for this inbuilt trial, they took a, diff a set of different non-IPF diagnoses and to be included in the trial, you just have to have progression. And the progression was either an FVC decline more than 10% in one year, an FVC decline of 5 to 10%, but worsening symptoms or CT extent of disease, or just worsening symptoms and CT extent. And that trial was very successful. It showed that actually in the patients treated versus those on placebo, your rate of FVC decline was much slower uh, with nintadnib. So we now have a therapy for those non-IPF patients who have fibrosis and lung disease that's progressive. The question I have is, you know, the, the way they looked at CT change was ILD extent. They looked at the extent of damage uh, on the scan. And I'll show you what ILD extent means. It's a visual evaluation. And you look at the lobes of the lung and you estimate how much of that lobe is damaged. And you calculate that as a percentage of the lobe. And then you add up the damage in the six lobes of the lung and create a total lung percentage uh, of damage on that patient's scan. And the problem with this is that uh, estimating damage in a disease like IPF, which is a fibrosing lung disease, is challenging because the fibrotic tissue shrinks over time and the lung being dynamic, normal areas hyperexpand to compensate. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. So in the lower lobes in this patient, that entire lower lobe was damaged and 33% of that lung is damaged. But in a patient with IPF, when that lower lobe is fully damaged, that lower lobe shrinks, the upper and middle lobes hyperexpand, and now that lower lobe is only actually 15% of that lung volume when I look at that scan. So that means I'm underestimating how much damage there is on that scan in a patient with severe disease compared to a patient with mild disease. And it's worse in the same patient over time where I underestimate how much worse their damage is getting over time. And this is why I think there are a thousand papers you know, finding baseline features of damage that can predict mortality in patients with fibrosis and lung disease, but are only three or four papers that show that disease assessing progression of imaging patterns over time can predict disease outcome. And this is really bad because, you know, it means that there's no evidence to suggest repeating CTs in these patients is useful, which means clinicians don't feel the need to repeat CTs which means that we can't get the data to show that imaging can actually be a very good endpoint to predict disease progression in IPF. It's a vicious cycle. And, you know, in these patients who have such a reduced life expectancy, radiation dose is not really going to be what determines how long they're going to live. So repeating scans in these patients, I don't think is that harmful. And then, you know, we're also, uh, problem, we have a problem with visual scores because we're stuck with the same terms we've been using for 20 years honeycomb cysts, reticulation, we kind of haven't evolved, even though our CT scans have evolved to become volumetric and you know, much lower dose. 
So are there things that we're not seeing on these scans because we're not looking for them because we're very comfortable with this terminology we've been using for these years? And that's where maybe the computer analysis may actually have some value. So computer analysis, uh, what is it really about? I mean, if I was a COPD clinician, I'd be much happier because you could just take the CT scan and take a particular density of uh, Hounsfield units and anything below that density you would call emphysema. But you can't do that in lung fibrosis because while fibrosis increases the density of the lung, I've also mentioned that you know, there are low attenuation patterns like traction bronchiectasis, honeycomb cysts, which are very poorly prognostic that you know, a simple one density threshold would not capture. So these methods didn't really correlate very well with outcome. But there are some tools out there now, and I've talked about these in my last talk, so I won't dwell on them too much, but tools that, assess, uh, that have been trained to assess what radiologists identify as being important patterns. And that was a tool from Korea. This is the one from UCLA. And this is the one from Denver. And, you know, uh, this is the one from, by Caliper from the Mayo Clinic. But unfortunately, they all train the computer to identify what radiologists think is important. And the question is, you know, you have a very complex computer. Is that really doing justice to the computer? Maybe the computer can identify patterns that we weren't aware of. For example, I know in Caliper, when the computers analyze a CT, it identifies five different types of theoretical ground glass density. Some of those may be more important than others. But when these tools were developed, the radiology community wasn't really ready for a computer to identify patterns that radiologists didn't know about. Uh, and you could tell at the time, you know, in 2013, 14, 15, when you went to RSNA, radiologists looked terrified that, you know, AI was going to come and take over their jobs. Well, now we know that that's not going to happen. It's going to be that these computer tools complement what we do. So maybe I think the community is now moving towards a, a mindset where we're willing to accept imaging features that maybe don't have a clear visual correlate uh, or, that one, or that we weren't talking about before being important uh, prognostically or to identify subgroups of patients. This is you know, what a caliper output looks like uh, in a patient with IPF, so asymmetrical disease with areas of honeycombing and reticulation on the right lung and you know, uh, ground glass densities and reticulation in the more expanded left lung. And again, you know, Caliper identifies three different types of low attenuation area, mild being more synonymous with normal lung or air trapping, and moderate and severe, more in keeping with areas of emphysema. And then it also identified uh, what it calls vessels. So these are pulmonary arteries and veins originating from the lung hilum, extending out into the periphery, but also picking up some associated fibrosis. A bit of work that we are trying to stress in our group at UCL is that alongside these computer analyses, which produce a huge amount of data, you need to be able to translate this information uh, into a way that patients and clinicians can discuss in a very limited clinic setting. Uh, so you need analytic improvements as well. Uh, so the way the Caliper team have done this is they've taken all these outputs on a voxel volume basis, which are summed to create volumes of each of these patterns and when you look at the total lung volume you can express these volumes as a percentage of the lung and they express it in a glyph and what the glyph does i talked about this last time as well is you know this white line is the predicted lung volume for that patient based on lung function and the size of the glyph is actually what their lung function really is that vertical line separates the right and left lung and these are zones of the lungs so upper middle lower Dotted lines are quintiles of lung volume, and the colors correspond to the proportion of that zone that is that pattern. So you can see that uh, in this patient, you know, the lower, lower zones are shrunken, mostly ground glass reticulation in keeping with an IPF kind of pattern. And these can be visualized in different ways, but it's very useful to identify progression of a patient's disease over time. So computer studies, well, uh, we started off when we used Caliper by comparing Caliper outputs to human outputs. And what we found was, uh, and these are the prognostic challenges and particularly looking at the baseline CT, that the computer tools, so Caliper outputs, uh, were 
the most strongly correlated was those vessel related structures, which came as a bit of a surprise to us. And on survival analysis, so on Cox regression analysis, the three strongest variables when you put in uh, visual scores, computer scores, lung function, was actually uh, two caliper related scores and a lung function composite index. And, you know, there's no way humans are ever able to quantify the vessels across 500 slices of a CT scan, but the computer was able to. And this only linked weakly with measures of pulmonary hypertension, because you'd imagine, you know, the only time people have talked about vessel related structures being important prognostically in IPF is for pulmonary hypertension, but they only weakly linked to pulmonary hypertension. So then we wondered, is it misclassifying interstitial lung disease? But actually, when you look at the scans themselves, most of the time it's picking up vessels. As fibrosis increases in extent, sometimes there is some associated fibrosis also present, uh, but it correlated very strongly with ILD extents. And what we think is that in areas of fibrosis, the vessels are destroyed, you get blood perfusion to more low uh, normal lung, which is of lower attenuation, where the vessels therefore can increase in size and more are picked up by the computer tool. And then we looked to see whether you, know, you could use this index, these vessel related structures to cohort enrich an IPF trial. So cohort enrichment is a strategy primarily used in, lung, in, in cancer studies where you look and identify patients that are the most suitable for your trial. So you take away those patients that are stable all the way through your trial because they're just not going to reach the endpoints that are important. In fact, they're taking away power from your trial and you just put patients in that you think are going to reach those endpoints. So we then took the median vessel related structure threshold on those scans, which was 4.4%. And we said, if you only include those patients into your trial, how many more patients would we reach your trial endpoint? And we found that 25% of patients would reach those trial endpoints. So you could reduce your trial size by a quarter, making it much more uh, cost effective. The question you would have then though, is are those patients you're recruiting just end stage patients? So they're the ones that would benefit from your therapies. And when we looked at that, we actually found that yes, those patients in, those, in that cohort of VRS threshold, more than 4.4%, who received antifibrotics did have a mortality benefit. So we were picking the right patients. Interestingly, in other fibrosis and lung diseases, I've talked about hypersensitivity pneumonitis before, we again found that these vessel-related uh, structures, as they increased in volume or percentage of the lung, they're associated with an increased mortality. It's often been wondered, you know, can you identify those hypersensitivity pneumonitis patients that have that poor outcome? And you can see in green here that patients with a VRS threshold greater than 6.5%, they could be found to have an IPF-like outcome, IPF being shown in yellow here, compared to patients with a VRS threshold less than 6.5%. So just looking at the computer could tell you how likely a patient with hypersensitivity pneumonitis was to behave like a patient with IPF. And we've also shown this in rheumatoid arthritis. In a collaboration with Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, we looked and used the same threshold uh, in rheumatoid arthritis patients that we use in IPF patients and showed again with rheumatoid being shown in blue and IPF in black, that you could find rheumatoid arthritis patients who had a disease behavior just like IPF. We also looked at serial change. So this is that longitudinal CT. Uh, to see if we could identify disease progression using this VRS threshold. And we found in 118 IPF patients that you could look at change in these vessel related structures. And if vessel related structures increased over that time by more than 0.4% of the lung, those patients had a very poor outcome. And interestingly, those weren't the same patients where their force vital capacity was reducing over time. And we found that you could identify 30% more patients reaching your trial endpoints by using lung function and CT endpoints together, suggesting another way of making drug trials uh, more efficient. Now, those are the bits that I talked about uh, last time I was at Cambridge, but this is now work from my group that we've been kind of pushing and pioneering over the past three years with a big break, of course, for COVID. And the first bit that I'm going to talk about is looking at novel imaging biomarkers and being specifically interested in the vessels, in the airways, sorry. Many different lung diseases are characterized by 
pathognomonic changes in the airways. So in cystic fibrosis, you get these very, very dilated airways, which may be plugged in black lung. And those are upper low predominant. But in lung fibrosis, and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, you get lower zone predominant dilated bead-like airways, which look very different to the airways that are non-traction related dilatation. So what we've done here is we've created an airway uh, tool that has two components. You first get an airway segmentation, which is you draw out the outline and the lumen of all the airways within an airway tree. So we've got an automated method for doing that. And then once you get that uh, airway uh, segmentation, you then skeletonize those airways and then you look at those airways as a graph. And then you can take the cross-sectional area of each of those segments, and a segment is the length of airway between branching points, and you can take basically an image perpendicular to the plane of that segment at millimeter intervals, and therefore calculate the volume of that airway segment or the rate of tapering or dilatation of that airway segment across the entire airway tree. And this is the kind of output we produce. So this is the trachea, and these are the first division main bronchi, and then these are the lobar bronchi originating from it. And you can see with our seg segmentation and then the measurements of air, air quant is the name of our tool, you can identify uh, the tapering rate, the size, the tortuosity of each of these segments all the way down to the periphery of the lung. And the size of each of these segments is proportional to the size. So the size on the image is proportional to the size of those segments on CT. And what we've now shown, and this is work uh, under review at the moment, is that in two IPF populations, the tapering rate or the lack of tapering of the airways uh, at different generation levels can predict mortality in IPF patients. Also the tortuosity of the airway. So this is the distance the airway travels versus the Euclidean distance, so the direct distance is a measure of tortuosity. The tortuosity of airways can also predict uh, mortality in IPF patients. And interestingly, when we restrict this analysis to the proximal airways, so that's generations two to six, the results are still the same. We always consider IPF a peripheral disease, but actually what we're able to show is that proximal airways are also changing dramatically in a way that we can quantify and relate to mortality. The other bit of new work that we've been doing is looking at subtypes of lung fibrosis. Now, when we look at an IPF CT scan, the range of CT appearances is really, really broad. And, you know, some look almost like COPD patients, some look like you know, end stage IPF patients. But other imaging phenotypes that we can identify uh, that give you a subgroup. And what we've looked at for this is a pattern called pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis or PPFE. And our interest in this is that today, you know, people haven't really found the subtype of IPF. Uh, but PPFE is now being recognized. It was initially recognized in patients undergoing solid organ transplantation, but now increasingly in patients with lung fibrosis. And you see elastosis enveloping the lung from the lung periphery on histopathology. And, you know, now it's been found in systemic sclerosis and hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And we looked at it in IPF. And it's these triangular opacities in the lung periphery that we're interested in identifying. And they're often associated with honeycombing in the lung bases. And you also get other pathognomonic features. So you get this suprasternal depression and a narrowing of the chest diameter or so-called platythorax to the extent that before I get to the lungs, I know from the chest wall shape that I'm going to see PPFE in that patient's lungs. And it's associated with recurrent infections and, as you may have seen on the scan, pneumothoraces. So we again looked at two IPF populations, about 140 uh, patients in each group, and we scored the upper lobes for PPFE and then trained the computer algorithm to recognize PPFE using those visual scores. And on the left, you have the CT, and on the right, what the computer is identifying is PPFE shown in red. And this is the correlation of the computer scores on the y-axis with the human scores on the x-axis showing they correlate quite well. And I'll stick with this, which is the pooled analysis, 
which shows that if you have severe PPFE versus just IPF, you have a much worse survival. Uh, and that identified about 31 of these patients on visual scores. But when we use a computer threshold, you know, outcome was much worse and it identified many more patients in this bad prognostic group. The interesting thing is that it doesn't correlate very well with other measures that we would think reflect lung fibrosis severity, so ILD extent or DLCO, suggesting that this PPFE pattern, because we know it's not just in patients with fibrosis, is a pattern that's almost separate to the fibrosis. So it's two processes with different trajectories happening in these patients with IPF. Uh, and now we've gone on, and this is another paper under review, to quantify PPFE change longitudinally. So can we quantify how much worse PPFE is getting over time? And this on the left are the baseline scans in two separate patients. And on the right, you have the second time point scan in this patient and the second time point scan in this patient in red showing how much worse the PPFE is getting over time. And here again, we show that in patients with uh, IPF and in hypersensitivity neuritis, if you have PPFE increasing by a lot, you're much more likely to die or have a poor prognosis than if you have no PPFE or just a small amount of change in your PPFE, suggesting again that this PPFE progression is actually a real phenomenon that's affecting patient survival. I'm just going to touch to end with on these two diagnostic uh, questions. One is the early identification of fibrosis, and that's, you know, these interstitial lung abnormalities or these areas of subtle change where, where we don't know what they really mean. And it's crazy that after all these years, we still don't know what early IPF looks like. To be able to identify early disease, you need to be quite fortuitous and capture these patients on imaging before they manifest disease. How is that possible? Well, actually, today that is possible in lung cancer screening populations, because in lung cancer screening, we invite older heavy smokers to have annual CTs, and these are exactly the kinds of patients who are going to get IPF. So in lung cancer screening, you know, only 3% of patients will have lung cancer, 3% will have fibrosis, but almost 11% of those patients will have these patterns suggestive of fibrosis. And if we study these, the hope is that we can then get computer tools, maybe, they can identify progressive phenotypes that can then be deployed in other settings, like identifying patients or relatives of patients with a genetic component to their fibrosis or patients with connective tissue disease where fibrosis may only happen in five or ten years time but you can image them and quantify how much worse that path uh, damage is getting and you know lung cancer screening is now rolling out in many different centers in the uk suggesting that you're going to have a huge data set of patients with longitudinal imaging that you can study and in many of these patients, they may be asymptomatic, so their lung function may be normal. So CT is going to have to push quite hard to be the modality with which we can identify a disease progression. The other benefit is that, you know, a lot of these patients are dying of cardiovascular disease. But when we look at a lung CT, we ignore the heart. We just look at the lungs. Now in these lung cancer screening populations, can we try and get a measure of lung and heart health, cardiorespiratory health? That's often something we miss out on, but the computer tools may allow that to happen. So to conclude, you know, uh, I hope I've shown you that computer analysis is identifying novel features that are prognostic in patients with lung fibrosis, which we just weren't aware of five or 10 years ago. And what's interesting is those patterns of vasculature, the PPFE, is providing new mechanistic questions about the pathophysiology of IPF, not just quantifying damage. The challenges we have are getting data sets. You know, there's a huge bias into who gets repeat imaging when they get uh, IPF. So there's a bias in the data we analyze. And there's also a degree of noise in CT scans, different reconstruction algorithms, different scanner types. We need to understand that as well. Uh, but yeah, I'm a big proponent, of course, of uh, computer imaging. And I think it's only going to get better over time. So having said all that, that's the end of my talk. If there are any questions, uh, yeah, more than happy to answer.